And uh, we're very pleased to have with us today, as our guests, uh, Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development, Navid Hanif. And uh, to his left, Astra Bonini, Senior Sustainable Development Officer in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And they'll present uh, the recommendations of the SDG progress report that's uh, come out from the Secretary General. I'll first uh, turn the floor over to Mr. Hanif. And then after that, Ms. Bonini will make some remarks and then we'll turn it over to you for questions. Thank you so much, Farhan, and good afternoon. I'm here to present the SDG progress report that was presented by the Secretary General to member states yesterday. And the report is a rescue plan towards for people and planet. And I just want to give you a brief overview of the state of implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. The report looks back at progress from 2015 when the SDGs were adopted. And the early efforts produced some favorable results like in poverty reduction, in child mortality, the fight to combat certain diseases, and expanded access to electricity, to name a few. But that has proven to be fragile, and most of it was too slow. So our preliminary assessment of the roughly 140 targets with data shown only about 12% are on track to be reached by 2030. Close to half are moderately or severely off track and some 30% have either seen no movement or regressed below the 2015 baseline. 575 million people will still be living in extreme poverty by 2030. Shockingly, the world is back at hunger levels not seen since 2005. And the way things are going, it will take 286 years to close gender gaps in legal protection and remove discriminatory laws. In education, the impacts of underinvestment and learning losses are such that by 2030, some 84 million children will be out of school and 300 million children or young people who attend school will be unable to read and write. These are disturbing trends. And our short-sightedness comes even more apparent when it comes to the environment. The Paris Agreement has been met with carbon dioxide levels continuing to rise to a level not seen in two million years. And vast numbers of species worldwide are threatened with extinction. So this is the state of the SDG implementation and implementation of the Paris Agreement. But SDGs still remain a unifying compass and an inspiring vision. We have no choice but to advance the SDG implementation. SG has proposed seven urgent actions, and let me briefly mention those. First, there is a call for all member states to recommit to action to achieve the SDGs at national and international levels between now and 2030 by strengthening social contract and reorienting their economies towards low carbon resilient pathways. Secondly, the report urges government to set and deliver on ambitious national benchmarks to reduce poverty and inequality by 2027 and by 2030. Third, the report calls for a commitment from all countries to end the war on nature. Among other measures, it urges them to support the acceleration agenda for climate action and to deliver on the new global biodiversity framework. Fourthly, it calls on governments to strengthen national institutions and accountability. This will require regulatory frameworks and stronger public digital infrastructure and data capacity. And finally, for greater multilateral support of the UN development system and decisive action 
at the 2024 summit for the future. So these are the concrete actions with 49 recommendations on specific measures that should be initiated at the SDG summit in September. Let me invite my colleague Astra to mention some of those. Astra. Uh, thank you, Assistant Secretary General. It is a sobering uh, update on where the SDGs stand at the halfway point to 2030. But uh, as ASG Hanif emphasized, the report's messages really convey that it's not too late to change course. And humanity has done this at many challenging points in history. Uh, and by committing to a rescue plan for people and planet, it is possible to turn things around. The report offers uh, practical guidance with 49 specific policy actions in three areas that can support major SDG breakthroughs. Um, the first of these looks at governance and institutions. And it focuses on how to equip governance and institutions for sustainable and inclusive transformation, really making them fit for change at the scale and speed required at this moment with seven years left. For example, evidence indicates that the SDGs are highly interlinked and cannot be addressed one at a time or by working in silos. But in many cases, institutions are not equipped for taking such a holistic approach. So the report urges investments in public sector capacity and infrastructure to identify trade-offs and enable complex decision-making, including by leveraging digital technologies and boosting cross-sectoral partnerships for implementation. The report also calls for designing national enabling frameworks to leverage the central role of local governments in SDG implementation, and for regulatory innovations that align private sector governance models with sustainable development objectives. These steps can strengthen collaboration around the SDGs while also helping to build trust and accountability. Of course, institutions require data to inform decision making. So the report calls for vastly scaling up data availability by increasing domestic financing and embracing new data sources. A second set of actions in the report involves policies and investments that have multiplier effects across the SDGs. These are interventions that instead of addressing a single SDG can then cut across the agenda to really push progress forward on multiple SDGs. Investing in women and girls, for example, would have widespread synergies across the agenda. Uh, by one measure, GDP per capita would be almost 20% higher if all gender employment gaps were closed. There are also recommendations to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and the uptake of digital technologies but in ways that reduce rather than exacerbate inequality. These include investing in inclusive and accessible digital infrastructures and building digital, digital literacy, or repurposing financial instruments to lower the cost of capital for renewable energy investments. There are also SDG multiplier recommendations related to investing in peace, protecting biodiversity, and providing universal shock responsive social protection, among many others. A final set of 13 actions aims to break down structural barriers that continue to stand in the way of transformative change. These urge for securing a surge in SDG financing and an, en and an enabling global environment for developing countries. These are, are meant to remove historic inequalities from global financing, debt, trade, and technology systems. The delivery of the SDG stimulus and reforms of the international financial architecture top the list. Additionally, the report urges action for fair and effective tax systems, scaling up aid for trade, establishing more efficient and effective technology transfer mechanisms, and increasing funding for SDG-related research. Together, these actions would ensure that countries have the resources needed to scale at, at scale to invest in both their immediate recovery and in long-term sustainable development outcomes, including climate action. 
the report on progress toward the SDGs can be a source of hope, giving practical guidance about how to pivot from a course that is currently aiming in the wrong direction toward one of sustainability and equality. And it sets the stage for global, national, and local commitments at the SDG Summit. Um, I thank you for the attention and, and happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll now turn the floor over to questions. First question goes to Edie Lederer. Um, thank you very much on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing. My name is Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. Uh, this is a pretty grim report and a lot of backsliding, and I'm sure that um, you will say that some of it is a result of the COVID-19 pandemic but there also have to be other factors. And I wonder if you would address some of them. For instance, how great a role is the lack of political will internationally to achieve these goals uh, playing? Um, is a more conservative environment having an impact. Um, what about the increase in wars and conflicts? Thank you. No two opinions about it that there is lack of political will, and that has been our message conveyed repeatedly that there is no shortage of solutions, policy choices that can be made to advance the SDGs. We need political will, political commitment at the highest level to implement the agenda. And that is our hope. The SDG summit in September will galvanize and will become a rallying cry for the world to come together to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs. Yes? Peace remains a prerequisite for development in any country and the world at large. Wars and conf conflicts do hamper countries' progress towards the SDGs, and we have witnessed countries in conflict face challenges in eradicating poverty, fighting hunger. So peace is a prerequisite for development. But while you are waiting to resolve conflicts and bring peace, society has to also focus on the basic needs of people. And that's where the international community has to help such countries to address the needs of their citizens. Thank you. Okay. Yes, James. Um, sorry, it's going to be another negative question, but um, James Bay's Al Jazeera. Um, were there too many goals in the SDGs? Was it too broad, too wide-ranging, too ambitious? First of all, just look at the scope of challenges we are confronted with. SDGs 1 to 6, poverty, hunger, access to water, health, education, gender equality. Can you ignore any of these needs when you are dealing with the society as a prime minister or as a president? Look at SDGs 7 to 14, your methods of consumption and production. What can you ignore? Job creation, access to energy, food. You cannot ignore those challenges where societies have to deal with them on a daily basis. Look at SDG 16 and 17, institutions, governance. Can you run a country without stronger institutions? And lastly, financing. So there is not a single issue. Let's look at, don't look at the numbers. Look at society's development. And all these dimensions have to be addressed if a society wants to progress and if you want to offer a life of dignity for every human being on this planet. Thank the problem you. is they've ignored all of them. That is at their peril. That's what we are saying. This promise is at peril. If you ignore the sustainable development goals, if you ignore people's basic needs, human beings desire to have a life of dignity, you are putting your society at risk. Let me also clarify. You are familiar with the Human Development Index, and that was a clarion call by the United Nations 30 years ago 
do not measure progress just by economic growth. Look at people's well-being. In the last three years, it has successively shown it's going downhill. Did not happen in the last 30 years. So if human development is in danger, you need to address from all possible dimensions this challenge. And then on topping that is climate change. How can you live on this planet when emissions are going up? Adaptation financing is not meeting the requirements of developing countries. Droughts are increasing. Floods are increasing. Can you ignore these challenges that are hitting at our doors on a daily basis? So I think the right question to ask is, it's not the SDGs are too many. How can I make sure that we bring the world onto a trajectory of development where climate is not challenged, Earth becomes a safer place to live, and yet human beings progress and meet their aspirations? That's the challenges we should focus on and don't look at the 17 numbers. Thank you. Uh, Stefanovic. And, and then back to you. Thank you, Stefano Vaccara, La Voce di New York. Um, it's a kind of a follow-up. Um, you're saying that it's not the numbers, but what about what the public opinion out there knows about the SDGs? Uh, myself, I did a kind of an experiment. Uh, this is in New York City, where the UN is headquartered. And if you ask around, you can just work on the street, and you say, do you know what SDG is? Um, only about 10% of people could identify. I'm not saying that they could say all the 17, but at least they could say, yeah, it's something that the UN is trying, or the world is trying to reach. And uh, now we are halfway. Um, so if you, if you they don't expect from above government just to do it, fine. I think you can continue to do like this. But if you expect that you know, from below, from the population, from the, if there is a movement toward trying to, to reach this, well, you com the UN completely failed because if New York doesn't know, I wonder uh, outside there how many people in the world knows about it. Let me share a personal story with you. I usually take cabs in this city and I'm asked usually, what do you do? I don't say I do it for SDGs. I say I fight poverty, I fight hunger, I work on health for people, I work for education for children, I want to make sure women and girls live life of equality, and believe me, not a single cab driver tells me, oh, what are you working on, something obscure, obsolete? That's what New York knows about. Homelessness, New York knows about it. When I travel to the developing world, when I mention these issues, job creation, industrialization, better consumption behavior, everyone immediately connects with it. So UN has never failed in advancing a vision of humanity which is based on equality, equity, everyone's ability to live life of dignity. So that's a message that has gone across and that's why this model is advanced by civil society and activists all over the world. Tell me one society where you do not hear the call for justice, equality, women's empowerment, children's health. Give me one country which doesn't talk about it. So the UN has never failed in presenting this worldview. And even now we are asking for major structural changes. When did you hear from any organization saying the financial system is morally bankrupt? UN has said that. So we are putting issues right in front of everyone, not people's movement. Just go about climate change and look at the younger people's marches all over the world, how concerned they are about their future. You are jeopardizing their ability to live better lives on this planet. That's the issue we're putting on the table. Read Secretary General's letter to his great-great-granddaughter. That is what we are talking about. Thank you. Um. Just, go ahead, I just, uh, this is also with the question on whether there are too many goals and then the, the general awareness. And um, as, as the Assistant Secretary General said, there may not be an awareness of what goal number one is in the general public, but there's very much an awareness of these issues. And, and what the 2030 Agenda does 
is present these in a holistic view that um, everyone can start to understand how interlinked climate change and poverty are, or uh, gender equality and access to decent work. So to be able to see all of these together uh, really requires there to be 17 goals because they're so interrelated. And if you leave out action on any one of these, it may undermine uh, the stability of, of attaining progress on some of the others. So it's a, a framework that enables uh, decision makers to look from a holistic perspective at uh, a group of issues that really need to be seen together rather than in separate silos. Um, if the SDG summit in September is going to be focusing on mobilizing political will, how is that going to actually look in practical terms? And is there going to be some mechanism that's actually going to uh, focus on implementation and call out specific countries that are making significant progress and those that are making none? So there are, th I would focus on three aspects of the summit. First, the Secretary General has asked leaders to, first and foremost, I cannot overemphasize the importance of national action. So SG has asked leaders to come to the summit with ambitious plans, your own plans at the national level to implement the SDGs. And we know countries who have shown great political commitment to implement the SDGs, and they are determined to advance those goals. So that's first requirement. Come to the summit with national commitment to do it. Second requirement, engage all segments of your society, civil society, academia, Business, private sector has to be on board. Change the model of your economy and give them a vision how do you advance the SDGs. Second ask is anyone who wants to come to the summit aside from governments should come with a commitment for specific actions. We are calling them high impact initiatives. So it's not just the political declaration which will be capturing the political commitment of leaders to advance plus the national plans, plus business community to come to the summit with high impact initiatives that can be advanced once the summit concludes and we have an action plan. Third, and that's an issue which requires special attention because of the current situation you mentioned, the macroeconomic environment, the inflationary pressures, the fiscal constraints, that there should be a plan to finance the SDGs. And for that, the SG has proposed SDG stimulus with three very clear elements. First and foremost, address the debt crisis. Countries are in high debt distress, over 52 countries. Second, $500 billion annually to be mobilized by the multilateral development banks, long-term affordable loans. Third, contingency financing. Whenever there's a crisis, an emergency, they should have access to liquidity. So these are very concrete ideas presented for the summit to adopt and also to launch the day it concludes galvanized action all over the world. And I must share with you the demand for such actions coming from the citizen side is loud and clear. They want something very meaningful to happen in September in New York. Sure. Sure. Go ahead. One quick follow-up, because obviously you're not going to get 193 UN member nations coming with ambitious plans and uh, specific actions. Um, is there going to be any basically naming of countries that haven't produced ambitious uh, plans and actions and efforts to try and spur 
them, because obviously those are going to be the countries that are going to be toward the bottom of achieving the SDGs. We will inspire by positive examples, not by naming and shaming. So we'll bring the leaders into the forefront who have a plan and they are committed to implement. What do they need? They need global environment which is conducive. They need support, technology, knowledge, financing. So if they come and announce an inspiring package of national goals they want to accomplish at the summit, what we expect, international community to move forward and help them achieve those. And they become then success stories to inspire others who are lagging behind to develop similar plans and bring them to the global scene to get partners to come and support them. That's the model we are going to pursue at the summit. Uh, OK, I don't see any further hands in the air. So I would like to thank once again our guests, uh, Naveed Hanif and Astra Benini. Thanks very much for your briefing. and. Uh, have have a, a great afternoon. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are in the press, please remember that there's one more person to speak to you, which is Paulina Kubiak, who's coming up to the podium as we speak. I just want to thank you and let you know we are available if you have any follow-up questions or if you need any material on this report. Thank you. Thank you.